to know, that is to understand the natural world around you, to care, to have a feeling for its welfare, that is, the attitudinal phase, the first is the cognitive phase, and then the third one is the action phase, knowing and caring, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do to make things different? And he used to talk about lighting a small candle in the corner of a dark room, and pretty soon somebody else lights a candle, and then the room is lit. You do what you know is right to do in reference to the environment, and that encourages others to do the same, then you got a groundswell. Started out, as I mentioned earlier, with the very modest idea of having a few craft on hand at the, at the camp as a point of education and inspiration for the staff and campers. I did not anticipate at that point having uh, starting a whole museum project. And so what happened uh, with the first canoe, which was a dugout, a basswood dugout, uh, that Professor Griffiths, M.G. Griffiths from the University of Toronto, uh, called me in one day and he said, you know, he said, you're a big canoeing camp. And I said, well, yes, we are. And he said, and I hear you're interested in uh, educating about heritage. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, I have a dugout canoe that you should have to put on display. And I said, well, that would be very nice. And I did not, hadn't had any idea about uh, the excellence of this particular specimen built by the Payne Brothers circa 1855. He had it stored at Lakefield. Uh, he had a property at that time on uh, the small, small farm and, and lake, uh, just, I think north of, just north of Lakefield, I believe. And um, so we went to see it, and I was astounded at what a beautiful specimen it was, and I immediately realized that we were onto something pretty good. And then I decided that, well, the, we have a dugout. Now the next best thing to, that we should be acquiring would probably be a birch bark canoe. So I asked a lot of questions from a lot of people, and they said, well, Manawaki is probably the best place for you to try. And somehow I contacted William Commander, William and Mary Commander at that time. And uh, we found there, he said, well, there's a birch bark canoe on for sale, I think, at the establishment, no longer there now, Poirier and Sons. So we went up and we stayed in the old hotel in downtown Manawaki, and we went to see the canoe, and it had a moose hunting scene etched in the bow and that really fascinated me because A, it was the first birch bark that uh, we would have then at, at the Candelore and uh, so that was quite important uh, for us and then I thought, well now what we should do is we're getting canoes now of different materials. we got dugout, we got birch bark and we should be looking around for other you know, quite striking types of canoes, so the display in the dining hall would be would be worthwhile. It wouldn't all be dugouts, wouldn't all be barks or, or skin kayaks or whatever. So then, uh, and then I was interested, of course, I, I had seen some of the major builders' canoes, like the, the Dan Harold canoe, the Rice Lake Canoe Company, examples, Lakefield examples, Peterborough examples, and so on. So I thought to myself, well now what we should be doing is acquiring samples of those different categories of canoes, because these are quite distinct categories. So that's how we uh, uh, moved along a little bit, and I think I got another, I'd have to check on the dates now, and I have those. Um, we got a canoe in Rosedale Heights in Toronto, which was supposed to be from somewhere in the Pan American States. I think the man told me he thought it was Guatemalan, but um, since then I'm not so sure that it is, and I finally pinned it down. I, I'd have to look the record up. And it had a, I know it had a chain at one end which fascinated me, and I guess that was to tie it up but it looked like an awfully typical, uh, tippy example. 
But the point about these craft were that they were all conversation pieces. They weren't just the ordinary uh, tripping canoe. Uh, and we were a big tripping camp. So it wasn't such a novelty to have some uh, tripping canoes, even though they might be from different firms. But I was more interested in a variety, and we succeeded in having that. So those were the... And I, I published a newsletter on the first canoes in the collection, which I should have to review uh, to be accurate about when we acquired these and uh, the, the whole story of the acquisition. But uh, at that point, when I had some of these in the dining hall, of course, the staff began to uh, mention the fact, uh, joking at first, uh, whether the camp was for old canoes or whether it was for campers and staff. And uh, so then I decided we'd have to develop a building, which I thought would be big enough for all time. Well, of course, that turned out to be quite wrong. Uh, so we could move the canoes out of the dining hall. And at that point, the acquisition process began to become much more organized. My, my first line of approach was to have canoes from Canada all across the nation. That was phase one. Um, and phase two was to get canoes from all the different companies, at least one example from all the different companies. And I was astounded at how many companies existed. Um, well, there were the, the traditionals, you know, the Lakefield, Rice Lake, Peterborough, Canadian, Ontario Canoe Company, Odette, Pangeli, and all of and Brown Canoe Company, and on and on and on. There were a whole, whole range of uh, companies and builders. So I wanted one example from each one. And uh, that's what I was working on. Now, mind you, I never turned my back on a canoe that didn't quite fit that planned program of acquisition. Um, so if one came along, even if though, though it might be the second canoe, for example, of Peterborough Canoe Company, one that we didn't have, but an, uh, another model, and they had many, many models, as you know, uh, we would look at it and, and, and try and acquire it. So that was the plan, and then uh, we moved later into uh, foreign canoes, and I called them Canoes for Comparison, uh, CFC, Canoes for Comparison. In other words, what was different about a canoe from um, the South Seas uh, or, or from uh, Canada, or from the United States. What were the differences between the Old Town Canoe Company of Maine and the Chestnut Canoe Company of, uh, at that time, Fredericton, New Brunswick, later, or Amokuto? So I got into that theme, and I, I was quite impressed at the subtle differences between companies. Um, it was interesting how different companies and different builders responded to uh, what a canoe should be. Now, mind you, there were differences in applications, too. Difference in uses, difference in waterways, differences in the ingenuity of the builders. All of these factors came into the picture. So I realized pretty soon there were all kinds of uh, permutations and, uh, and uh, on the nature of the canoe and the way it was built. And then I got really ambitious and thought, you know, here we are, we're trying to you know, get canoes from across the nation. What about the West Coast? That was a special example. When I read about and saw photos of canoes of the West Coast, um, it was fascinating to me how different they really were. And so that's when we got into the idea of commissioning a canoe to be built. And through Harold and Marion Penny, who were our ambassadors, we commissioned a dugout canoe from the Haida people up at Masset, uh, Queen Charlotte Islands. And uh, I was very excited about that because there, there just weren't any canoes of that type in eastern Canada. 
and so it was quite a quite an important uh, uh, thing to to do to commission it. And I think we put several thousand dollars down on that one, and there's a whole story, and it's one of the prize uh, prizes in the fleet. So, so there were. There were in the collection then canoes that were exciting to look at, different, um, canoes that people probably had never seen. And then there were all the examples of local builders, local, by, I mean, especially Ontario, but also from the other provinces uh, to a lesser degree that people could identify with. It, it was nice to see people come in and say, oh gosh, my grandfather had a canoe like that. And through, uh, through the collection, which is now growing, we developed all kinds of interested people who became members of the, of the museum project and who would say, well, I don't know whether it's still around, but my, my family had an old canoe that maybe would interest you. And of course, I'd follow it up and go and see it and then go through the acquisition process. So I didn't, I didn't turn down too many canoes either because what I would try to do, I would say to people, now, we would like you to donate this, or if you insist on having a canoe in its place, we will find a canoe for you. And uh, some people said, well, I want it to be a new one. And we even went that far. We'd get a new canoe in trade for the historic specimen. Or... Um, we, w we would purchase and that was the most difficult uh, most of the canoes we had to purchase uh, people say well you know I need the money and uh, you, you can have the canoe but you won't have to pay for it and I wouldn't turn it down because if it happened to be an important specimen so be it uh, I did realize early in the game that uh, in the acquisition process you get an offer and you don't say no. You go for it. And sometimes it takes some negotiation, but but nonetheless. And sometimes I did both. Sometimes I'd replace a canoe plus so much cash. So it was uh, any combination of those uh, three forms of acquisition. My people say, well, I didn't have a policy. Well, I did have a policy. I did have a policy, and I tried to explain that in the program of acquisition, getting representation of a company and then getting representation of the different models of that company, uh, getting representation of different models of individual builders, because everyone built many different types of canoes. They didn't just build one canoe. In the strengths of our forefathers we go, not in their footsteps. It is their stars we follow, not their dead campfires. I like that. That's a rallying cry for the future to carry on and do your best in things that are worthwhile, in things that are worthwhile.